Hi, I'm Ian Bonds. I'm front house and monitor engineer for Stephen Wilson. We're in the Mir Theatre today in Hamburg. This actual tour we started last year, this, this time last year actually, last January. We've gone back to doing, weirdly going back, gone back to doing monitors in front of house now. Whereas Porcupine Tree used to own a little, will still own a little Yamaha O2R96, uh, which as far as I'm aware still works. We haven't switched it on for 10 years, but we'll see. Um, but, um, but yeah, so now we're on monitors in front of house, uh, mainly because when we did the first tour, some of the venues we were in were not quite as technically good as, they, as we would hope. Uh, smaller, smaller clubs that all of them looked far ex extremely well, but we didn't want to leave uh, monitoring and stuff to chance. So I had a Pro 2C at that time and just did the monitor mixes in front of house. Got it set up within about an hour at the first rehearsal, and I think the show file's pretty much unchanged. Everyone has an in ear of some kind. Um, uh, the drums are a hard wire because there's no, you can't go anywhere, so he's on hard wire. Uh, Bass and uh, Alex, the other guitar player, are on stereo in ears, nothing else. Uh, Adam, the keyboard player, has stereo wedges and a mono in ear. In fact, he doesn't even have an aux end, he only has the click track in his, in, in his ear pieces. That's all he has, so I don't even use an aux, I just patch him straight from the input of the, of the, of the, of the, of the box to the output onto the... and it just goes straight through. There's no level control, he's just got a volume on his pack, that's it. And it's just a click? Just, just a click, and yeah. Music and Coming from his wedges, yeah. Oh, okay. So as soon as he doesn't need it, they're out, you know. And uh, Stephen has stereo wedges and a mono in here, which is not good. But he has a mono in here, um, which he only puts in when he's singing or when he needs a click. As soon as he's not needing either of those things, he just pulls it out and, and goes back into the real world. You know. uh -huh. he's, he, he's, he isn't a fan of headphones of any kind, so apart from when he's out, out walking, he'll have a pair of Walkman headphones on, but that's pretty much it. Uh, it doesn't mix on headphones, doesn't do anything on headphones. Uh, the picture delay is not really an issue because there's, apart from Nanette on Pariah, which you'll see later when she's on the front screen, we have, we have, basically we have two screens. We've got an LED wall at the back and we've got a thing called a Holonet at the front, which is essentially, um, it's supposed to be an invisible screen. And when it's in, it, it really is invisible. We had to put chairs out when we had it in, in rehearsals because you couldn't see it. We used to walk to walk, to walk into it. It's about 20,000 euros, so you don't want to do that. And you can't repair it, so you really don't want to do that. Um, so we have that on a projector on the front. Uh, the problem comes, because we're touring PAs and stuff, is getting everything to fit where we need it to go without anything crashing into each other or overlapping. Or And usually it's me that has to kind of go in the wrong place if you like because the projector and the screen kind of have to go in um, it dictates where the front of our stage is so today we have a truss that's about two meters on on stage so the front of our the band's workspace is two meters up stage because that's where the truss has to has to go for the for the holonet so and in some places there isn't a lot more behind that, so we have to be really, really careful where we end up putting stuff. Well, we have a certain depth. Uh, our, guitar, our guitar tech has these special shoes that he paces everything out to. So ideally we have 11 feet between Stephen's pedal board and his guitar amp. And then there's a six foot, riser behind, six foot deep riser behind that. And then there's two eight foot risers either side. So, and then we have cables at the back, lighting at the back, the video wall at the back. So our stage size is dictated by how far apart we can get that holonet and the LED wall. In some places in the US, it wasn't much. <laughs> I mean, a no riser day, you know, because there's not enough depth. So it wasn't much fun, but yeah. I don't know, I have no idea what it is. I just have, I have the gig running in my head that I want it to sound like, and I move things until it matches as close as possible. That, that's the only way I can describe it. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that the band are extremely good at programming sounds. Steven's very good at arranging stuff. I mean, you've probably heard on other things with, the, with various band members that if we're at rehearsals and he doesn't like, or he, the, the sound's not quite right, he'll go and just tweak someone's pedal. Go, that's better. They go, oh yeah, okay. So we do a lot of 
a lot of the work in getting it right happens at that end in rehearsals before we even get as far as this and that really makes it makes a difference yeah you can't fix it in the mix if it goes in wrong it stays wrong yeah. it's you know so we try and get it as right as possible i like the midas digitals because they sound like the midas analog simple as that the workflow is pretty much the same it's it's definitely quirky it's definitely built by old blokes in birmingham but i'm kind of an old bloke and it works for me um everything kind of make makes sense for me but uh I know others, others struggle, but they just like it, but the sound is correct for me. Well, this, this one I bought in 2008. This doesn't go out on hire very, very much, so I kind of keep it for me now. The smaller ones go out a lot, but I keep this one for me. If you don't switch it on in the right order, it can get a bit funny. So we make sure that end gets switched on. The DSP for this is actually on the stage. So in theory, if nothing leave, if, if you have something on stage that goes into there and is patched to something on stage, you can unplug this this console and it will keep going. Is the theory? Never, never, never tried it. Don't want to find out. But in theory, that's what will happen. Um, so yeah, we switch it on in the right order. When it's really cold, we had some stuff last year, and we we're going to probably be having it again, where we were loading into venues. It was minus 18 degrees. Finland was minus 18 degrees. Um, so of course, you bring everything into a warm venue and it's just instantly condensation so we try and get the power on as soon as possible switch the console on and just walk walk away from it don't worry about what it's doing don't worry about the lights it'll go nuts for a few few minutes come back to it in 20 20 minutes switch it off switch it back on again all good the thing i was interested in this year and last year actually this year this year this year was the dmb soundscape which is very cool it's a completely different approach to doing PA than what we used to doing with a big pile of boxes or two big hangs of speakers left and right. Uh, but because we do this quad thing on these shows, um, which gives another dimension, there's stuff coming from, from the back which you're not expecting, and you know, which is kind of cool. Um, the soundscape thing is another level of insanity for that kind of surround things. It, does, it doesn't do panning, you, you, and you don't have master faders any, anymore. Each channel fader is the master fader and in the software you place that microphone on the stage and then wherever you are in the venue if you set it up right it sounds like that instrument's coming from there so I could put Adam's Hammond module as if it was a Leslie cabinet stuck behind his, his, his riser and physically put it there on the software and when you're sat here it sounds like a Leslie cabinet on the, on the stage but if equally if you go and stand over there at the bar it'll still sound like Leslie cabinet coming from the stage so the panning's done with phase and with uh, delay, basically. Very, very clever. Good question. Yeah, I haven't worked best. that out yet. I haven't worked out. I'm, I'm sort of thinking of doing a hybrid version, actually. So I can keep my <coughs> big left, left and right rock and roll stacks <coughs> and, uh, and then have the, all the extra effects and quadraphonic stuff actually done with the soundscape because it reduces weight and reduces... Because, you know, it's more stuff to put in each day and we're already getting in at 9 a.m. and we're kind of ready for sound check at three and we haven't stopped in that time. So adding another, you know, 20 something speaker positions and then trying to find out where to do it in a venue. I mean, for this, I mean, this one would be great because there's trusses each side. You can hang stuff up across the back, maybe across the front here, not so bad. But you get into a theatre with three balconies and lots of fire exits and restrictions. Yeah, that's that's not so easy you know if we could plan ahead and do it it would be yeah maybe I th it would just be then getting all the outputs we'd need and getting it set up and the software running and having it pre-programmed so you can literally roll in flash the speakers and go right okay go that would but you know there is there is time to do that usually before a tour it's just uh, you know a question of physically actually doing it my design is always to hit the front row with the array. I'm not a fan of this, oh, we'll do it with front, front fills, and it doesn't work. Yeah, you, you, may lose, you may lose a little bit of level, but what you get is you cover pretty much. I mean, if we have got some front fills in just to get over the volume of the stage, but if you walk to the front with just the main arrays on, you can hear it front center with no problem. It's all there. So we've got, you know, from the back row of the of the circle to the front of the, of the barrier covered with the array. And the first thing I do when I get to a house rig is look at where their PA is pointing 
have a disappointed look on my face and then when I put the music on I walk up to the front and I'll stop and put a bit of tape and go your PA finishes here we need to fill this you know 10 meter gap or whatever it is um, and I usually they haven't thought about that 10 or 15 years ago when you had a lot of side, side fills and monitor wedges like yeah okay I can hear the vocal because it's coming off the stage not gonna happen now you get a fully in-ear band there's no coverage there is nothing there yeah, yeah, yeah. so right. you have to cover it with the PA it is kind of odd I mean years ago I was mixing uh, Dream Theatre well, 2002 and they and they'd just gone over to in-ears and ISO chambers instead of having a wall of boogies which is what JP used to use he now had three cabinets in in, in, in flight cases under the stage so if, if you didn't put the fader up there was no guitar and I mean no guitar even in rehearsals nothing so you had to you know it had to come out and you then soon find out how good your mic placement is as well not thing, a, a deal with the campers but with a you know with a mic'd up cabinet off stage you you suddenly find out you know how good or bad your mic position is because you know because you're not listening to the the roar of the stage you know weirdly we did talk about this uh but when we, at the last porcupine tree show that we that we did which was 2010 i think october 2010 the manager was all keen and fired up and wanted to take it to somewhere bigger but basically said well the sound's bad in this place i said well let's just not use speakers then because what do you mean don't don't use speakers I said well just do it like a silent disco like the, like the 2 a.m. disco for people who want a party on after a festival. There's, there's no noise, they've all got their headphones on, turn up as loud or as quiet as they like, everyone has their own personal taste. We, I mean, and with the way noise laws are going, because it's, it's getting lower and lower, people that there's more legisl legislation with, and laws about what you can do. Like we've just been to Belgium, that's 100 dB over 60 minutes, which is actually quite easy. Uh, the French do 102 over 10 minutes. You know, it, it's all starting to you know, people looking after their, you know, citizens really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, keep them safe from people like me. Um, but why not have, say, bring your bring your smartphones? Everyone has one. Everyone has some headphones. You see people walking around headphones all the time. Okay, we're going to broadcast you it, or there's going to be a link to uh, to a, to a site, and you put your headphones on, and we'll not take any speakers with us at all, make no noise. Because those days will, will come at some point, I'm sure. The, but the, there's always things you want to improve. There's always new things to try. I'm looking to buy the next size system up from this, which is going to be a fair chunk of cash. But I'm already sniffing around that, and thinking what to do next. Uh, so it'd be nice to do some bigger, bigger rooms. I mean, on this particular run, it's a little tricky because we've got everything from small clubs up to, you know, reasonably big rooms. And we've only got the one truck because the smaller rooms, you know, you can't necessarily have two trucks on those places. Uh, so it would be nice to go back to our two trucks and a nice little bit of a bigger system for the bigger, bigger rooms. That'd be nice. Um, but yeah, but we'll, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what music he comes out with next because he's always, it always changes. There's always a little twist or a little turn somewhere that it's completely different from the, from the previous album. So we'll see what he comes out with and then we'll go from there.